general introduction to quantum groups. And uh, uh, so maybe as a motivation, we can st I will start from also flat connection like Marco was, uh, was telling. So the motivation is that we have these flat connections coming from conformal fields here. So next to Matthias' talk, namely the cosmological uh, uh, connection. So then you have a connection, a flat connection on, on a configuration space. You have so C to the N, uh, and, and you uh, N, be C to the N, uh, on C to the N, where the coordinates are different. And on this connection, on this uh, hyperplanes where the ZI. Uh, equal to ZJ, you have regular singularities. So the connection will be something like uh, um, DZI, uh, D over DZI, minus <coughs> 1 over kappa, some parameter HI. And this HI are the sometimes called Godin Hamiltonian. So you have a sum of all J such that j is different from i of some r. And then we use this notation to be consistent, z i minus z j. And uh, so this connection is on a trivial vector bundle with some fiber v, which is so a... R is a matrix? And, and this is a multiplication? Yes. Yeah, okay. v, uh, v is a representation of, of a, a simple the algebra, for instance, SLM. And, uh, and it's Rij uh, is, is uh, so you have an arrow of Z, which is in G tensor G. So this would be the algebra, but it's more general, G tensor G, which is uh, uh, R of Z is equal to sum over uh, Eij, maybe GLN, to be simpler. EIJT times EJI divided by Z. More general, in the simple algebra, you have a Casimir. So those IJ, they are different nature indices, right? From right, maybe I should use operators, <coughs> right. RS, SR, RS from 1 to N. And Rs would be the matrix with the one position, Rs and zero elsewhere. So this is, uh, in general, you have some kind of quadratic Casimir in the, in the Lie algebra. And, uh, and this Rij means you take this R and you act on the, sorry, this is on. So you have a trivial vector bundle uh, with fiber uh, V tensor V. And copies of it. vector bundle with this fiber, and you have a differential equation, which is the flatness of this uh, horizontal sections of this connection. And so you have a function with values in, in this, functions you want to the n, and, and they are supposed to obey this differential equation. So this is uh, the uh, the some logic of connection, and it is flat. And uh, the flatness... The differential equation is what? Uh, the, 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 the flatness of this connection, sorry, uh, follows from uh, some. Uh, is, 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 so this is flat, but it follows from the fact that this hi and hj equal to zero, and it is a flatness condition. <coughs> and uh, so, uh, because it's flat for all values of kappa, so you have separate. Uh, uh, conditions on the two things. So this is <coughs> easy to check <coughs> from the form of this connection and the fact that it is, is Q symmetric. 
and, uh, uh, and, and, and this follows from the so-called classical Baxter equation. R, which is R, uh, R1, 2, <coughs> 1 minus Z2, maybe R I, maybe let me call it R I J, R I K, Z, uh, Z I Z J, but it's really a universal equation. <coughs> And if you sum over cyclic permutations of i, j, k, three terms, you get uh, zero. <coughs> so, uh, so this is the uh, Pearson-Samarotchik of equation, and it's a flat connection. And uh, so, one connection to the quantum groups, but will not be the emphasis of, of this course is that uh, uh, the monodromy of this connection, so this is what this representation of the fundamental group uh, uh, is, is given by R matrices of the corresponding quantum group. But, uh, but I, I would rather uh, consider the quantization of this story here if you would like to replace classical Young-Baxter equation with quantum Young-Baxter equation. And then there is also a connection in the quantum world, but it's not a, a connection in, in this sense. It is a kind of difference operator of Frank and it is a system of difference operators which commute. Okay. <clears throat> so, but uh, one interesting thing is that there is some sort, sort of dual version of this story. That what Giovanni is. The equation for R, it comes from the flatness condition, or it's just equation that you wrote for yes. some unknown reason that we don't know yet. Right. So, so whenever you have a solution of the classical Young-Baxter equation that you can think of as a rational function with or, or, or meromorphic function with values in G tensor G, which obeys this relation, then the connection is flat. It's, it's basically equivalent. Uh, maybe you have to use the fact that it's Q-symmetric. And so that would be an example of a solution of, of uh, the classical yeah, but the equation, but there are others. And the KZ equation is what again? Is the flatness of this connection? Or the, is that a, uh, the KZ equation is, uh, is the equation for horizontal sections. So the correlation functions of conformal field theory in the best sumino witten model, and I guess we'll hear about that more in Matthias' talks, is this. Yeah, they obey this, this relation. That's called the KZ equation? That's, That's the KZ equation. Uh -huh. For this example of R. Uh, sorry, maybe one more question and continuation of Sasha's question. So once you have uh, young Baxter, you, you, you think you have a flat connection, but then this is not necessarily super flat, meaning that separately the commutator term and the uh, differential term vanish, or is it always like that? It's, it's always like that. Maybe it's, it's flat for all kappa, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, so then there is also the kind of separate, one problem is to solve the KZ equation, the other problem is, uh, since you have commuting Hamiltonians, these are the Hamiltonians of these Godin spin models, you can use about common eigenvectors for these operators. That's kind of the integral of the side. Okay. And, uh, but now there is this observation that you can do the same thing in a diff slightly different kind of dual setting. Now I take W to be... Uh, <coughs> Again, the trivial vector bundle. It's fiber. Uh, w, some representation of GLN. GLN. 
maybe W is a tensor product of the V, or it could be another representation. And, uh, and then you can still write a, 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 the same equation. the hi will be uh, um, so j uh, different from i as before and eij eji it would be uh, rij I will not write any upper, upper indices uh, here and I, I, I define EIJ. Yeah, okay. J different from I, uh, H, lower uh, IJ, and Z I minus J. Uh, and so maybe it's better to make it symmetric. EIJ, EJ I plus E. J i. So here I mean, uh, maybe I should write rho of e i j and rho of e j i. I mean the action of these generators of g l n on the representation. So this is some sort of dual version of the same story. Now, now I don't act on different uh, uh, factors of the tensor product, but I look at different uh, uh, matrix elements. So maybe I should use r and s instead of i i j. So it is kind of dual and uh, and uh, right and so the, the, the claim is that this is still a solution of the of the classical inverse equation and you also have so the additional condition that comes from the fact that you are acting on this tensor factor is that you also have that rij rkl is equal to zero if i, j, k, l are distinct. Which is automatical in this case, but it is also true in this case. And these two conditions uh, tell you that you have a flat uh, connection again. Is this r, i, j independent of z, or you? Z1, z2, z, w. OK. So, uh, so, so now, uh, picture that one gets is that so that you can quantize both so then there is also another story maybe I will not enter into too much that you can couple these two equations introduce dynamical parameters but uh, uh, this maybe is not what I want to say so um, but uh, uh, so the story is that you can quantize the story is a kind of more famous quantization. You can replace the Young-Baxter equation, classical Young-Baxter equation, by a quantum Young-Baxter equation, which historically came before the classical Young-Baxter equation, I believe. And, um, and but you can do also something similar on this side. You can quantize also this uh, equation, and and here the, the name is the dynamical quantum uh, Weil group. Giovanni, like, uh, before you said that uh, the KZ connection that corresponds to conformal blocks of a WZW model, now is there some physics uh, story? For yeah, I believe so, but uh, I'm not sure I can uh, express it. So I think it has to do with the trigonometric uh, um, case, namely you can take, uh, take an elliptic curve, so you can do the kinetic model, the R equation, and you go to the degenerate trigonometric limit, you get a trigonometric type of equations. And then you have an additional parameter which appears, which is kind of the boundary condition at, uh, at the double point. And, uh, and, and in that parameter, you have this core equation. So, but now we should just formally think of yeah, yeah, this is an analog of the KZ, but uh, right. what it means, we don't quite know. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so <coughs> here there is also a story about monodromy. You can generalize this to other root system, and, and the monodromy is given by, by the 
what? to buy a group of Rusty and this is the result of Toledano Lareda. Okay, so, uh, so I would like to say some words about this correspondence and, and the quantization. And, uh, and, uh, and one thing that we are discovering is that this has to do with this uh, how do I, so I would like to explain that how do I, which is a kind of generalization of the short while do I, if for GLN. Okay, so this is uh, one story, but now I will be introductory, so maybe it will be boring for many people. tell you about uh, quantum groups and the uh, young Baxter, maybe and uh, such as young Baxter equation. Quantum young Baxter equation. Quantum groups, the motivation of quantum groups was to understand the solutions of the quantum young baxter equation. So uh, let me say what that is in some settings. So you have to, let's suppose you have three vector spaces, one, B, two, B, three. You can think of these vector spaces to be all the same, V, all. <laughs> but uh, but there will be parameters which appear which are correspond to these parameters. Mm -hmm. parameters. So you can you should think of maybe even if the v1 v2 are the same, you should think of them as three copies of the same vector space, but corresponding to different uh, values of the spectral parameter. Okay, and uh, <coughs> and then suppose you have something for each pair. You have <coughs> in the endomorphisms uh, of the corresponding tensor product, and maybe let's say i is smaller than j, you can generalize. And uh, so an invertible. And the Young Baxter equation will be for, for such three matrices will be uh, Rv1, V2. Maybe I don't need to write parameters here, V1, V3. Rv2, V3. Rv2, V2, V3. Rv1, V2, V3. So it is the same product in the opposite order. And, uh, <coughs> But one has to understand what it means, and maybe I will use that notation again. So I will write 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 2, uh, 1, uh, 1, 3, 1, 2. Uh, so this is an equation in uh, endomorphisms of V1, V2, V3. And these matrices act on the corresponding factor, the only way they can act. So for instance, you have R, V1, V2, will act on the first two factors and as the identity on the third factor, right? So this is the uh, uh, young baxter equation for matrices. And uh, maybe uh, at the moment it is a little strange equation, but uh, one uh, way to understand it is to do the drawing. So if you have two vector spaces, you will represent uh, a matrices with such a crossing. In knot theory, you, you might want to, to draw it like that, but uh, not here. But um, and, then, and then there is a famous uh, picture for this equation, which is something like this. times in my life, but I can still do it very smoothly. Okay. 
something like this. So you start with, uh, you, look from, you look at this equation from bottom to top, you start with three vector spaces, v1, v2, v3. And if you view this as composition of operator. You go up and whenever you find a cross, you write the R matrix. For instance, uh, the right hand side, you start with V1. This line corresponds to V1, so uh, you write V1, 3, and so on. Okay, so this is, and so it has kind of topological meaning that you can move one strand uh, through, through, the <coughs> through the point. And so this has to do with uh, integrable systems. <coughs> Out of this army, you can construct uh, commuting operators. Namely, uh, so uh, you define, I don't know, some transfer matrix. And so what is this trace? Well, you have trace, you, you, you start, say, in this case here, you have, you have something in endomorphisms of V1 tensor V2. You identify this with endomorphism of V1 Then uh, you compose with uh, trace tensor the identity, and you land in end V3. OK, so the claim is that these operators commute. This is kind of the famous uh, consequence of the Young-Baxter equation, which started out in statistical mechanics with Young and Baxter. And so you have that uh, the transfer matrix is commute, so the lemma. TV1 TV2 TV2 TV1. And if you if you happen to have many of these V1s for the same and V2s for the same V3, for instance, if V1 depends on a parameter, which is the example I will uh, explain in a second, then you get uh, infinitely many commuting operators, and as, as many as you need. <laughs> situations to prove that your quantum system with Hamiltonian say TV1 is, uh, is integrable. We'll see an example soon. And the proof is, uh, is that uh, you, you write this equation as RV1, V2, V1, V3, R, V1, V3. Then, then you, this will cancel, and you get the, the uh, product of uh, uh, transfer matrices in the, in the two orders. I should write two, three, and one, three. Okay, so this is <coughs> the famous consequence, and then uh, the, the, uh, the example, the simplest example is. Uh, this method and I, yeah, so it goes back to the 60s, sorry, yeah. uh, is you take uh, V to be V1 
equal to two plus three, that to be. But you, you think of them as depending on, on parameters, the one, the two, the three. And uh, so R the one the two the subject is R depending on the one and Identity matrix plus h bar, h bar is parameter of the times one over z, p, and p is a permutation of factors. It's a very simple matrix, and you can check. Maybe it should be an exercise. So, Gabriele, by the way, is our TA. It's a good exercise to check that this is. Uh, this is very useful for the first time that we are actually uh, right. <coughs> so this is uh, the story. And then the other observation that makes even this very simple matrix interesting is that if you have such solutions of the young baxter out of solutions of the young baxter equation, you can construct new solutions. And <coughs> So the general statement would be the following. Suppose now you have so suppose you have more. We have, like four, we have many such solutions, like four, for instance. And then we have R, B, I, B, J, uh, for I smaller than J, so that, uh, so obey, obey the yeah, Baxter equation for all subsets <coughs> of three elements in, in, in subsets of three, uh, then, uh, then you can construct some new uh, uh, equation corresponding to the tensor product of two by uh, fusion or something like this, which is R V I V4, R V I V3. And this will be the homomorphisms of the I tensor. And this you can consider as a second space. So that's for I equal 1 and 2? For I equal to 1 and 2, yes. And uh, the drawing is uh, uh, of this. So in the geometric, it's very clear what you have to do. And then just uh, uh, the, the best thing is to, to use this picture here for double lines and, and the, uh, the uh, I'm, I'm a bit lost with the notation. So what was this R, V, I, V, 4, 1, 3 meaning? So well, this is one four. That, uh, one four and one well, uh, is I four. I four. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's. Uh, I don't know. Why do I use this twice? Yeah, I'm a bit lost with this. Yeah. So I think it's uh, it's uh, it's better to write it in this way. Namely, it's an endomorphism of this space. Here I have three spaces, and this is one, two, three. Oh. That uh -huh. kind of the notation. So this yeah. means I yeah. act uh, with V i and V four in the only possible way, namely act on this V i and this V four, which is the first and the third factor. Yeah. It's I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. better notations. So okay, so this is and, and then the claim is that uh, is that if you take V one, V two, V uh, V three and V four. 
and you take this matrices R V1, V2, R V1, V3, V4, construct it in this way, and R V2, V3, V4. And that's the equation. Okay, so this is this is how you construct it. But and, and it's useful to to have this general formulation. But you sh you should think of this V as to be all the same, and uh, but maybe with different. Uh, So, and, uh, and in this way you can construct some kind of more interesting transfer uh, matrices. You can, you can construct a tau n, the transfer matrix. By iterating this procedure, so you have to, uh, tau n would be the transfer matrix. factors by iterating this construction and, uh, and this is what appears in statistical mechanics of spin chains. Namely, so tau n would be you, start, you, take, you, take, you take the trace so here it is useful to number the factors as 0, 1 to n and then you take the trace over over the zero copy, so we just write trace zero of R uh, zero N one R zero one Z minus Z one. So Z would be Z would be Z zero if you like. This is the point associated to this first factor which is called auxiliary space or something. The claim is that this transfer matrix is commute. <laughs> so Z1 so and Zn are fixed. Fixed because they correspond to the space on which we act. But then you can vary uh, uh, what we call Z1 and V2 before, namely you can vary uh, Z. And so tau n of Z tau n of w commute. <coughs> and so these are really transfer matrices in the sense of statistical mechanics. And uh, for instance, uh, you can, by taking the derivative at zero or something, so you take, I think you have to take the normalized. Uh, so this RV, V tensor n, is an endomorphism in V tensor n plus one? That's right. So uh, I like to think of it as endomorphism of two spaces. One is V and the other is V to the N. Okay, and then what is R0N or R01? Yeah, then, then uh, ah, so how is it constructed? It's constructed oh. in this way. So then it's better to number this as a zero space and this is the space 1 to N to distinguish it. So R0N will be acting on this copy and the last of this thing here. And so it's your, the original R, this one, oh, yeah. oh. not this new one. Right. Okay. This, this is R, this R. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. You can do this generally, right? Uh, right. And, uh, so, so I think uh, uh, if we normalize that, just to have the, the, the numbers correctly. So to normalize the McGuire Young matrix would be, uh, I think, R of Z equal to Z plus. And let me, uh, let me put this parameter P because 
plus h bar. So this is normalized in the sense that it obeys this in inver inversion relations. It's invertible, more, moreover, you have this relation with the inverse. Uh, then, uh, and then if you take, you, you take tau n prime of zero, maybe tau n of zero inverse is a Hamiltonian essentially of the Heisenberg model, Heisenberg chain. For, N, for a capital N equal to 2. So you take SL2, you take this, and uh, this is maybe plus a constant. It is a Hamiltonian of the Heisenberg chain. So you have a chain of one-dimensional crystal with n sides and a spin one half particle in each point, and, and you have a famous. And, and, and from higher derivatives, you get higher. Uh, yeah. Yeah, then this Hamiltonian will commute with all these tau. Uh, <coughs> yeah, many integrals. <coughs> OK, so this is kind of the story. And now, what, what is the relation between with the classical young Bachelor equation? Yeah, so. Sorry, and in this normalization equation on the second factor, you also need the, to put two one to flip the slots, or so I want this to equation. Want yes, one. yeah. I mean, in, in this case, it doesn't count because it's symmetric. But in general, people impose that uh, that relation. You, you have to impose. Yeah, you have to switch. You also flip the slots, right? In this case, it has has no effect. But it doesn't matter here. <coughs> right. So, uh, so this, this relation may be understood in this way, right? This is equal to this. Yeah. OK. So now, uh, uh, the semi-classical limit. So suppose you have a family of, uh, so now let's, let's take this kind of equation of the same space and spectral parameter, and it obeys the Gangbuster equation with the three values. So, okay. So maybe I should write it because I didn't never wrote it explicitly. With spectral parameters. Here I act on two, three. Here I act on one, three. And here I'm one, two. And here is the same thing in the opposite ordering. Then, and if you write uh, R h bar of z, and suppose that <coughs> this is the identity plus h bar times small r of z plus order h squared, then, uh, then R is a solution R of z the solution of the classical Young-Baxter equation. And if you have this additional uh, inversion relation, then it will be skewed
Another 10 minutes, how uh, Yeah, I think we have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. right, so maybe I should skip some. I would like to, to say something about the setting of Hopf algebras where people... Inter so, so historically, people had this uh, solutions of young bachelor equation arising from statistical mechanics. And then people wanted to solve to diagonalize the transfer matrix, introduce the Betty and Zatz and the Leninger school uh, uh, developed uh, this quantum interscattering method to do that. And then this was formalized uh, uh, into the notion of quantum groups. So it was already present in the Greningrad school, but probably the, the definition that I will give is due to uh, Drinkfeld and Jim. <coughs> and the setting is a setting of Hopf algebras. So uh, what is a Hopf algebra? Then you have an associative algebra A. should see, so the kind of the main example, the classical example would be you take the group algebra of a group. So you take linear combination of, formal linear combination of element of a group, so you give a group. And, uh, or you can take uh, the universal enveloping algebra of uh, the algebra. These are the classical examples and then uh, what appears here is some sort of new, new story. So what is the Hopf algebra? You have an associative algebra, but you have some additional structure in these two cases. Namely, the way you, you know it, that you have an additional structure, is that if you have a representation of this object, you also have a representation of the tensor product. And this is not true for general associative algebra that you can. And the, the thing that allows you to define a representation of the, on the tensor product of representations is that you have a, a coproduct. You have a map from A, A to A, which is an algebra homomorphism. homomorphism. And, uh, <coughs> and you have a few other things, but also, uh, so this allows you to define tensor product representations of A. And if you have V, V tensor W, so V and W are representations, so you have an action of A, uh, then uh, you can act on a tensor product by acting with the Product and the coproduct acts on the two elements and, uh, and uh, so coproduct means that that it so it's a co-associative coproduct so the fact that uh, delta is an algebra homomorphism implies that this is again a representation but then you also have some associativity of the tensor product uh, uh, coproduct that you have that uh, like this. Which uh, implies that uh, uh, this representation here are isomorphic. And, uh, but then you have a, a, a so, so and in the example, so for A equal to group algebra, then the delta G is G tensor G, the way you act on the tensor product of representation. And if A is a universal enveloping algebra, you have that delta X is X tensor the identity plus one tensor the identity. Then you have a couple of other gadgets. 
in, uh, in, in this example. <coughs> and you have a trivial representation and you have dual representations. Those are the units, maybe I should say a little bit, and that's only as a unit. And then you have, uh, you have a very work over C, but you can do it. So this is a co-unit. So this defines a representation. And, uh, and then you have the antipod. Which is not an algebra homomorphism, but it becomes an algebra homomorphism if you, if you use the opposite product. It's an algebra anti-homomorphism. And so this allows you reps, namely, so if, if, if V is a rep representation, then V star is the action times alpha is alpha composed with S of alpha, S of A, <coughs> is a representation. So, and, and so, plus some axioms which ensure that this is kind of well defined. What's alpha here? It's an element of <coughs> A is in A, alpha is in the dual, linear form. Mm. So of course, if you act from the right, you have to invert the factor. That's why you need something like this. So, <coughs> so you have a couple of axioms which make something like, for instance, the, the, the trivial representation of the tensor unit. So anyway, so as I try to mention, so that you have some axioms on the algebra side which can be translated into axioms on the category of representations. And the two notions are more or less equivalent. There are ways to, under certain assumptions, to reconstruct the algebra from the category and so on. <coughs> but, uh, uh, yes. but now, what about uh, uh, what is? No, I don't have time to give the example, so I will do it uh, next time. So now, in, uh, when we do, rep ah, and we, and we uh, say, so maybe we'll go. So epsilon of G is one for all G in the group case, epsilon and S of G is the inverse. This is what you have in groups. You can invert elements. And similarly for the algebras. OK, so uh, <coughs> now, uh, so. What is, so I, 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 I don't have time now to, to define an, a simple example of such a whole algebra which is not classical, but what is new with respect to the classical examples, that when we do group theory or, or representation theory of, of the algebras, we are used to the fact that V tensor W is isomorphic to W tensor V, and this is what is new. In the, in the case of, uh, of this kind of quantum groups. And uh, so, so in, in, in general, the for W is not. Uh, so, so, this example is still true. But so, so, uh, so, in quantum groups, we have for finite dimensional quantum groups that the tensor W is isomorphic to W tensor V, but the isomorphism is not what we have in the classical case. But this kind of more complicated object, which is uh, which is related to our R matrix, but I will it's slightly different, so I will write it. So we have an isomorphism of this type, and uh, 
And so R VW is equal to P and VW. P is this transposition and, and this R VW is an endomorphism of the V tensor W. So what is new is that uh, you have a non-trivial isomorphism between one ordering of the tensor factor and the other one. But this non-trivial, you have this story here. So this non-trivial isomorphism can be chosen to be consistent with, uh, with three factors. And this implies the Young-Baxter equation. So this was the uh, idea of how to find the uh, solution so of the Young-Baxter equation. So you, you start with the Hopf algebra and you construct those, uh, those maps, which, which are this isomorphism between uh, different volumes of tensor factors. And uh, the axioms will tell you that you can choose those in a consistent way, and uh, namely in such a way that uh, if you go from V tensor W tensor Z, Z tensor W tensor V, in two different ways you get the same answer, and this is the Young-Baxter equation. So this is how, how this appears. Okay. So uh, and then there is some some kind of more inter more uh, refined statement about this that this R matrix comes from uh, a universal R matrix. Namely, uh, there is an element R, so you have a universal R matrix. In A tensor A, which obeys the Young-Baxter equation of the universal case, and uh, so that RVW is a representation of R in V tensor Okay. So, so this is the story, and I, I, I will give the example, the simplest example tomorrow. Uh, so this is in, in some kind of ideal world. That the true world is not so nice as, as this. For instance, uh, the universal R matrix, even in simpler example like UQ of SL2, will not really be in A tensor A. It will be some completion. It will be some kind of infinite series uh, in A tensor A. But when you evaluate this infinite series on any pair of finite dimensional or highest weight representations, then uh, you have infinity many times which are zero and, and the sum re reduces to a finite sum. So you, 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 this R matrix exists kind of morally speaking, or you have to introduce some terminology, some kind of topology, logical and But then when you evaluate it in finite dimensional representation, it's a way to find So this is for finite dimensional quantum groups. For infinite dimensional quantum groups, which are related to those loop algebras and, and spectral parameters, which is what we, we are interested in, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is also not quite true. Is, so V tensor W is not always isomorphic to W tensor V, but it's only for generic spectral parameters. So there is an additional difficulty, and the result is that you get R matrices which have poles, right? This is not defined if Z is minus H bar. Okay, but uh, except for that, there is, there is a nice theory behind it, and and I will explain more kind of presentation theory of GLN tomorrow, and then I would like to explain the uh, survival duality for GLN, and then this more general version how duality, and the relation between those two uh, types of young Baxter equations. Okay. Thank you.
It's just a question about the physical interpretation of uh, this. You said that, uh, for example, this uh, occurs in crystallography for crystals. Okay. Heisenberg model. Yes. yes. And so uh, this R operator is supposed to model some interaction between protons in crystals or something yeah, like I that? I think there are kind of two interpretations. One, one class of models is classical two dimensional integrable models in dimensions. And there are the so called six vertex models. Uh, models that you can write, and, and then this is a transfer matrix in the usual sense of statistical mechanism. You, you, you write an operator with mass just row to row, and then the partition function is the place of the power of the operator. But, uh, so that's it. For that, you take the transfer matrix with fixed z, you also z1 to zn, also all equal to zn, then you get a homogeneous model. In the limit when z goes to zero, you get this uh, Hamiltonian of Heisenberg shape. So you get something like SL2, you get H will be sum over near, nearest neighbors, sum over i of the spin at the i position and i, I plus first position. That would be a transfer matrix at or the derivative of transfer matrix. I didn't understand the universality of this R matrix. Right. So if you have if you have an, uh, uh, an element of A tensor A, then for any pairs of representation of A, you get an endomorphism of these pairs of representations. And if this R obeys the Young-Baxter equation on the universal equation, then it automatically obeys it in all representations. Submitted and for any triples a solution of the young back situation. And uh, could you please explain again this upper indices in brackets? It was a bit confusing for me. Which bracket? This upper indices in, in brackets. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, this is when you have, I don't know, you have an operator x, which. Then, I don't know, now you have three vector spaces, or four, I don't know. You want to construct an operator which you are acting on these two factors and the identity on the other. So now it may be in this case it's a little stupid because, because you know where it's supposed to act. But maybe if all the spaces are the same, then it's better to use that notation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm okay.